Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Robert. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, Israel's strategic attack on Iran achieved all of its operational goals. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that the powerful and precise strikes crippled Tehran's missile defenses, as well as its rocket and drone production capabilities. He added that this debilitating attack was part of a systematic months-long campaign to sever the tentacles of the Iranian octopus, Hezbollah and Hamas. Netanyahu said now Israel has delivered a devastating blow to the head of the octopus, Iran. The unprecedented attack on Iranian military targets and its industrial factories of death, 1,000 miles from the Jewish state, involved 100 Israeli aircraft and lasted more than three hours. Iranian leaders are calling to speed up the fanatic regime's production of atomic weapons in the aftermath of Israel's devastating military strike that crippled Iran's missile production capabilities as well as its air defenses. Tehran has been racing toward nuclear breakout while claiming that its rogue nuclear program will be used for peaceful purposes. Now members of the Iranian parliament have openly called for nuclear weapons to deter the Jewish state. Meanwhile, there are several reports of dissension in the ranks of Iran's leadership amid rumors that Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is gravely ill. The 85-year-old theocratic dictator has ruled the Islamic Republic with an iron fist for 35 years. His reign of terror has left a stream of carnage across the globe and especially in Iran itself. Analysts believe the brutal dictator will choose his second-born son, Moshtaba Hosseini Khamenei, to succeed him. Israel's Channel 12 News has reported that the vast majority of Israelis support former President Donald Trump. The news station cited a survey showing that 66 percent of Israelis support former President Trump over Kamala Harris. In contrast, only 17 percent of Israelis support Vice President Kamala Harris for president. This comes as American Jewish support for the Democratic Party has plummeted to the lowest point in four decades. Russia has aided the Houthi rebels in disrupting global commerce by providing targeting data on ships in the Red Sea. The Wall Street Journal revealed that the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen used Russian satellite information to attack vessels in the strategic waterway. Now, this intel was passed through members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps who were embedded with the radical rebel forces. The report noted that Moscow's head red, President Vladimir Putin, is determined to create instability in the Middle East and undermine Western influence in the region. Since November of 2023, the Houthis have attacked over 100 cargo ships in the vital Red Sea shipping lanes. Two freighters have been sunk by the terror group and one was hijacked to Yemen. The Israeli Knesset passed a set of laws that will bar the United Nations Relief and Works Agency from operating in the Jewish state. This will effectively end Israel's cooperation with the anti-Israel Palestinian aid organization. Jerusalem announced that it will no longer issue entrance permits to UNRWA employees and that it halted all IDF cooperation with the UN body. This notoriously corrupt organization has been repeatedly accused of harboring terrorists and funneling funds to Hamas in Gaza. Just last week, UNRWA admitted that one of the leaders of the October 7th massacre in Israel was on its payroll. Israel says that more than 10 percent of UNRWA's staff in Gaza have ties to terror. The IDF has uncovered extensive evidence of the UN agency's participation in promoting Hamas propaganda in schools, as well as allowing Hamas to hide its terror infrastructure underneath UNRWA facilities. The United States Department of Defense has promoted the employee suspected of being responsible for the October 18th leak of Israeli intelligence to Tehran. Ariane Tabatabai is now the Assistant Secretary of Defense in Lloyd Austin's office despite serious concerns about her loyalty. Tabatabai was the subject of an expose that revealed that she is a member of the Iran Experts Initiative, which works with the fanatic Shiite regime in Iran. 
The America First legal organization is suing the Biden-Harris administration for stonewalling a year-long investigation into the Iranian-born American intelligence official. The recent leak of sensitive Israeli intelligence is an indication that the current U.S. administration is spying on Israel and sharing that information with Iran in an effort to handicap the Jewish state. The Israeli army has recovered dozens of documents in Gaza proving that Al Jazeera has been cooperating with Hamas. The intelligence reveals that six reporters for the anti-Israel Arabic language news station are active members of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror groups. Other documents from Hamas operatives direct the news network not to condemn the terror group on air or report on failed rocket launches inside of Gaza. The IDF noted that it found unequivocal proof of direct communication between Hamas terrorists and the Qatari media network. It also found evidence that Hamas established a line of communications to terror leaders in Qatar through Al Jazeera. The network has acted as a mouthpiece for Hamas by spreading anti-Semitic lies and falsely accusing Israel of genocide in Gaza. It has also been accused of endangering Israeli troops by revealing their location on air. The Hezbollah terror group appears to be collapsing. Hundreds of its fighters have fled Lebanon. Israel's campaign against the leaders of the Iranian proxy militia, coupled with the IDF's ground offensive into southern Lebanon, is working, and Hezbollah terrorists are fleeing in droves. According to the LF News Agency, Defectors are failing to report to their commanders when summoned, and many have abandoned their post. The mass desertions caused a communications gap between Hezbollah leaders and their terrorist fighters. And now there's growing concern among Hezbollah's masters in Tehran that the wave of desertion will spread throughout the ranks. A replica of the Ark of the Covenant has been unveiled in Jerusalem. The Bible describes the dimensions of the Holy Ark, which held the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. It took 17 volunteers more than three years to construct the Ark according to the exact details in the Bible. It is made of more than three tons of Egyptian acacia wood and coated in gold engraved with biblical scenes. A pair of winged cherubim sit on the top. The Bible details that the Ark was taken into battle by the Israelites. Member of Knesset Ohad Tal pointed out the significance of the Ark as Israel fights another war. He said the Jewish people are not just fighting Hamas to bring security to Gaza or the northern border in Lebanon or against Iran. We are fighting to bring back the unity that the Ark of the Covenant and the Temple in Jerusalem represent. And in a related story, Rebecca, hundreds of Kohanim and Levites recently participated in a full-dress reenactment of the water libation offering mentioned in the Bible. Members of the priestly class donned biblical vestments and led the procession through the old city of Jerusalem while Levites played musical instruments. The priests marched to the Siloam Pool where they filled a specially made solid silver vessel with water from the Gihon Spring while the Levites sounded pure silver trumpets. The Temple Mount Institute in Jerusalem has been working to recreate temple artifacts according to biblical specifications. This important work has made the ancient temple services relevant and accessible to today's generation. The Institute is also preparing all of the biblical instruments for use in the future Third Temple. The Israel Antiquities Authority has announced that it uncovered tens of thousands of artifacts this year. Eli Esquizito, the Director General of the IAA, announced that despite war on seven fronts, the IAA excavated 120 sites throughout Israel. The antiquities range in age from the prehistoric period spanning to the first and second temple periods. This includes the discovery of an ancient road dated to the time of Jesus on Mount Hotzvim. The Antiquities Authority offers volunteer programs allowing tourists to participate in active excavations, and many significant archaeological finds have been discovered by volunteers. We at Israel Now News would like to invite all of our viewers to visit the Holy Land, touch the earth, and connect with the rich history in the land of Israel.
That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. We're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is David Weiner. He is a director in Republicans Overseas Israel. David, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, this is the big week, uh, election coming up in just a couple days. How's it looking? Look, right now it looks it, it looks good. It looks promising. I think a lot of the battleground states are really leaning towards Trump. Uh, so for us, it's very hopeful. I, I think we've we've been able to get a lot of votes out of Israel as well to help help out with the campaign over there. So. The Israel operation this time around has been quite massive. Uh, I understand that there are 500,000 potential voters out of a, a 10 million uh, population, which is really unbelievable. What have you done on the ground? Yeah, so basically we set up uh, different places where people can come to sign up. And we set up uh, places that they can drop off their ballots to get them back over to the, over to the states, whether it's with the embassy, whether it's with other organizations. And we also help people actually fill out. There's a lot of elderly people that are first-time voters. They never voted in the States. They live there, never voted there. And so we help them fill out stuff. Donald Trump is incredibly popular in Israel. Some polls say of the Jewish population, he's about 80% support. Why is he so popular here? Well, I think if you look at his previous administration, it's just night and day between the current administration and under Biden and Harris, where he... You know, he moved the embassy. Like everybody said before, he did it. He recognized the Golan Heights. He did all kinds of stuff for Israel that was very beneficial for us. There's a lot of people concerned about a possible Kamala uh, presidency here in Israel. Are those concerns uh, unfounded, or is there a reason to be concerned? Not so long ago, she actually, when Israel started going into Lebanon, she said right away, she didn't say anything about helping Israel. She said, we're going to give $176 million to help rebuild Lebanon. This is Hezbollah that's doing it, Iran doing it. Why would you help them rebuild? It doesn't make any sense. And she's also slow, uh, slow walked a lot of weaponry that we needed in order to have more direct attacks on, uh, you know, to reduce civilian uh, uh, casualties on the other side. So it's been very difficult working with the Biden administration. There's not just a lot of American voters in Israel. They, they tend to be from swing states, places like uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania and um, even, you know, Wisconsin and, and Georgia. Can the voter base in Israel make a difference in the election? Yeah, so I think it can definitely make a, uh, a difference in places like Pennsylvania, where I vote. And quite a few people that I know vote there. Florida as well, even though Florida looks like it's going to be uh, Republican. Um, but there's other places that there's a big difference. As we know that the House is split. The, con the, the House of Representatives and the Senate are pretty much split. And places like New York right now, or actually when it comes to uh, seats in the Congress, are looking very hopeful. When you talk to people in Israel, is, is their vote just dependent on how the candidate sees Israel, or are there other issues that are important to them in the American election? We tend to be here in Israel, tend to be way more conservative when it comes to uh, family issues. And what we see going on in, in America, we are kind of trying to protect Israel from having it come over here with all the different uh, things with with uh, child surgeries and you know gender affirmation surgeries, all this kind of stuff. It's something that's very worrisome to the more conservative Jews that happen to live here in Israel. There's an incredible rise of anti-Semitism in America, yet the Jewish population tends to vote with the Democrat Party. Do you think this time around it will change? I think that it will change slightly. I don't know how much it will change. I know in the, in the religious areas, it, it's gonna go for Trump. 80, 90% it will go for Trump. In the other areas, I think a lot of them either won't vote or it'll be a, a very small change. I don't think it'll be a great change. The real question is why? You know, if Jewish people are under attack in America, if Israel is in danger, why wouldn't Jewish Americans say, all right, this time around, I'm going to vote with a party that's more sympathetic to my issues? I think it's just a legacy. They're just used to it. I don't think they... they don't necessarily look at the things. That's why I said it's mostly the Orthodox will vote for uh, the Republicans because they do take into consideration a lot more of the social issues that tend to be more uh, conservative leaning, as well as Israel is, is a big thing, even though they also care about the, the pocketbook. They have bigger families. It's harder for them to raise those families when they have less money. So that's very important for them as well. 
What does a Trump victory mean for Israel as you see it in the short term? Well, I think it's short term and long term, but a Trump victory in, in the short term, you see a while back, as soon as uh, Iran fired missiles into Israel, he came out and said, you know, Israel should go and destroy the nuclear facilities in Iran, which was the total opposite of what Harris and Biden said. They said, don't do it. Just don't do it. Make sure you don't do it. You don't touch it. And they, the same thing with the oil fields, the same thing with Hezbollah, the same thing with Hamas. He's, he said, go get rid of them. Wipe them out. Take them out of there. They don't need to be there. That's the same thing he did with, with uh, ISIS. This is, this is what he's expecting from Israel to do, and then he'll give the back also when he's president. And what do you foresee would be the long-term effects of a Trump presidency here in the region? I think long-term, there's a couple of things that people don't necessarily realize actually are in play and have actually happened already. Previous to the, to the attacks on October 7th, there was actually an agreement already signed with Indonesia uh, and Israel, which it was publicized slightly after, after uh, October 7th, but it wasn't put out there because, because of what's going on. And then after that will come Saudi Arabia, will come all, all these other more moderate um, Arab countries that will join in the Abraham Accords. And I think he, he led it, he created it, and he'll continue it. David, there are literally tens of millions of people watching the show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Yeah, so I think I would ask you as the audience watching the show, I think it's very important the relationship between Israel and America. And a vote for Israel is a vote for America. And a vote for Trump is a vote for Israel. And that's why I would request of everybody to help us lift this country above all the enemies and vote for the Republican Party in the coming elections. Thank you, David, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. And now the truth from Zion. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, otherwise known as the JCPOA, is the nuclear agreement that world powers created to combat Iran's quest to manufacture nuclear weapons. Six major world powers, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China, all came on board, signing the deal in 2015 with the intention of limiting Iran's ability to develop weapons of mass destruction. The agreement called for strict limitations on and the monitoring of Iran's nuclear activities. In return, Iran would get relief from economic sanctions, which the international community placed on the country in 1979, when the imperial state of Iran was overthrown by the Islamic Republic, which is still ruling today. Up until 1979, Iran was a more westernized nation, where people had the power to express themselves freely, both religiously and culturally. This came to a dramatic end following the Islamic Revolution, led by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. Most of the world responded to the overthrow by ceasing to do business with Iran, resulting in an economic decline. Iran committed to significant reductions in its nuclear program. They agreed to limit uranium enrichment, which is a process used to produce nuclear fuel. They also agreed to reduce their stockpile of enriched uranium and change their nuclear facilities to make them less capable of producing weapons-grade material. Or at least, that's what they promised to the world. Iran got access to many of its assets that had been frozen, and as trade renewed, the country experienced an economic boost. The terms of the JCPOA included routine inspections, which the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, would conduct. But Israeli intelligence said the organization was simply not doing its job. In April of 2018, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu came out with findings that shocked the world. A few weeks ago, in a great intelligence achievement, Israel obtained 100,000 secret files, and here's what we got. Iran lied about never having a nuclear weapons program. After signing the nuclear deal in 2015, Iran intensified its efforts to hide its secret nuclear files. Even after the deal, Iran continued to preserve and expand its nuclear weapons knowledge for future use. 
Iran lied again in 2015 when it didn't come clean to the IAEA as required by the nuclear deal. The Iran deal, the nuclear deal, is based on lies. Much of the world watched with disbelief. Organizations like Al Jazeera and the BBC referred to his statements as mere accusations. The JCPOA was never supposed to be a permanent agreement. It had a time limit and specific provisions that needed to be met. The deal was designed to be reviewed and renewed periodically. When Netanyahu called the agreement into question, its closest ally, the United States, took the evidence seriously. Israel breathed a sigh of relief in May of 2018 when U.S. President Donald Trump withdrew the United States from the JCPOA and reimposed sanctions on Iran. This was a horrible one-sided deal that should have never, ever been made. Trump referred to the deal as the worst deal ever made in history because it gave the Iranian government everything with nothing in return. Today we have definitive proof that this Iranian promise was a lie. Since the initial revelation by Netanyahu, Israel has shown the world more and more evidence conclusively exposing the Iranian regime's true ambitions of pursuing nuclear weapons. Nevertheless, world leaders are hopeful that the United States will rejoin the accord, while much of the Jewish world, and certainly the state of Israel, are working hard to prevent a horrible one-sided deal from re-emerging. It didn't bring calm, it didn't bring peace, and it never will. Iran's leadership has said time and time again that it wants to wipe Israel off the face of the map and has even publicly alluded to using nuclear weapons to do so. Israeli officials are lobbying world leaders and conducting high-level meetings to share their concerns and their hard evidence of Iran's real intentions in an effort to convince those leaders that Iran poses a risk not only to Israel's security, but the security of the region and the entire world. Up next, the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Today we're excited to be in Migdal HaEmek in the north of Israel and what we're going to see today is the opening of a new home that's going to be assisting people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. The ICEJ has been privileged to help with the establishment of this beautiful home and we're here to bless it as the people begin to come. I will tell you just a bit about this house and first of all thank you Thank you very much for your generous donation and help us to open that place. Uh, it was needed before the war and it was start to establish before the war and the war is coming and, and mm. now the needs is like, like here, really. Three psychologists with different uh, um, fields, like most about the trauma, most about EMDR, stuff like that. We have amazing crew of instructors that are living here 24 7 and making all the non formal relationship treatment, which is how to find the balance again, how to find the safe place again. Since 1980, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem has been a voice of Christian support for Israel and connected the global church to the land of the Bible. Headquartered in Jerusalem, the ICEJ has taken action to stand with Israel by caring for Holocaust survivors, helping Jewish families return home to Israel, providing bomb shelters, fighting anti-Semitism around the world, and by inviting Christians to discover Israel for themselves. First of all, we are extremely privileged to be here today. Your nation deserves to live in peace and security. And Amen. We hope soon houses like that will not be needed anymore. But right now we do everything to enable this Israel, this nation to return back to normality as soon as possible. And uh, we want to do the best what we can to help in that. Amen. It's a privilege for us. Mazal tov. 
So we opened this house less than a month ago. We have an agreement with the Ministry of Defense and we see many people that came from that, um, from that field, from post-traumatic uh, syndromes. Sometimes it's from recent time, from that war, and sometimes it's uh, from different uh, wars. That, that war is just resonated and brings it back to alive sometimes. Uh, we see people in high level of anxiety. Something starts going wrong. They start um, having some post-traumatic symptoms. Psychoeducation is also part of it, to normalize it, to normalize what's happening, and to build the progress together, to explain how we treat with that, how we treat with post-trauma syndrome, and helps them to believe that they have the force to, to pass it. I feel blessed and to, to know the, the Christian embassy and to be able to see how much amazing things, how many amazing things you're doing around the world. I feel that you are solid ground in a very shaky time for Israel in general. For me as Israeli citizens, for me as a Jewish, you are very solid ground for us. And I want to thank you a lot. After Hamas brutally attacked Israel on October the 7th, 2023, the ICEJ has been actively standing with Israel and her people through advocacy and urgently needed aid projects. Now is the time for Christians to turn their love for Israel and the Jewish people into real action as never before. Your donation will help deliver bomb shelters to at-risk areas, provide necessary supplies for first responders, care for evacuees with food, shelter, clothing, and trauma care, and will eventually help rebuild these devastated communities. Visit icejusa.tv to donate online or call 1-800-910-6355 and give your generous gift today. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Robert. And I'm Yochanan El Rome reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.